The cluster is starting its spin. Clear signal for firing. Time is X minus 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. In 1958, America entered the space age with the launch of their first satellite. One of the key figures behind this launch was a New Zealander named Dr. Bill Pickering. As head of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Pickering led America into the space race. His team sent the first spacecraft to the moon, preparing the way for the manned landing, and then onwards, exploring throughout our solar system. Pickering had the vision and the tenacity to overcome great obstacles taking humanity on one of the biggest adventures of all time. All of us who, who knew those early pioneers look with great respect uh, on anyone that we recognize, and right up there at the very top in the scientific robotic spacecraft is Bill Pickering. I said I would like to do the deep space program, and they gave it to me. And I was delighted because, to all intents and purposes, I was sitting there with a contract that said, go out and explore the solar system. And that was a wonderful contract to have. The story of William Hayward Pickering is the story of the most intense period of technological development in human history. He was born in Wellington, New Zealand, in 1910, the same decade as the first aeroplane flew. My mother died when I was about four or five years old and my grandparents brought me up. They lived in Havelock over near Picton. And uh, so I went to primary school in Havelock at this uh, little two-room school in this little village way out in the, in the countryside of New Zealand. In those days, he was known in Havelock as Billy Pick. Everyone called him Billy Pick. Uh, we met at the primary school and he was my best friend and we did everything together. I can remember when the first automobile uh, appeared in, in the town. I can remember when the first telephones appeared. And I can remember when we first had electricity. Bill was here from 1915 to 1923. He was quite a good student. He's noted as a good singer in a newspaper account of a farewell party for a teacher who was going away to be married. At school, Billy and I were under the dreaded Miss O'Connor. She was a shocker. She used to walk around with a ruler in her hand. And whenever she saw me with a pencil in my left hand, rap over the knuckles. But uh, Billy and I were in the same class. I remember we were a little bit competitive, I think, uh, for the first and only times in our life. Of course, he soon outstripped me. Sir so Ernest Rutherford also went to this little two-room school, of course, a few years, 10, 20 years before I was there. The uh, grandparents apparently recognized that he had some educational skills and uh, encouraged him to uh, set his sights high, and, and at some point he moved up to Wellington, went to Wellington College to finish his education up there. When I was at the Wellington College and working in amateur radio, building up a station there, I had a crystal set which was receiving broadcast signals and so I took this over to Havelock once and let my grandmother listen to the radio. I remember I had gotten a, an Australian station and this was a Sunday and they were playing dance music and my grandmother was horrified. <laughs> they, were playing, they played dance music. The country was really going to the dogs. At this early age, Bill Pickering was already showing an intense curiosity for new technologies. This willingness to explore would lead Bill on an incredible journey from his rural New Zealand childhood. We have sent spacecraft to vast distances in the solar system. Uh, we communicate with these spacecraft uh, on the entire journey. 
Uh, we navigate them to do exactly what we want them to do. And uh, it, it is, in retrospect, it is a rather remarkable series of technical achievements. Bill excelled at Wellington College, taking an interest in maths, science, and astronomy. In his final year, he secured a university scholarship. Bill had one year here at Canterbury College doing engineering. He did maths, pure and applied, and physics and chemistry in the buildings around here. Um, and he was quite a good student. He got the maths prizes. But after that year, he had an uncle who was marrying an American lady. And they were going back to California, and so they invited the Bill to go with them. And the uncle supported Bill's education at the California Institute of Technology. Bill studied electrical engineering and also took an interest in the new field of cosmic ray research. He undertook high altitude balloon testing with Nobel Prize winner Robert Millikan, eventually gaining a doctorate for his work. I expected to go back to New Zealand and work in the electrical engineering field. And he did want to look for work down there, but the only thing that he's expressed about it is that there weren't a lot of jobs for electrical engineers in New Zealand at that point. And Caltech was waving a job in front of me, and so I came back here and joined the faculty at Caltech as a professor, actually, of electrical engineering. Well, my mother uh, was from a family that had lived in the Southwest. She had a brother named Gordon, who had a roommate named Bill Pickering over at Caltech. So that's uh, how she met him. It was while Bill was at Caltech that a group of graduate students started experimenting in early rocketry. Uh, that became too dangerous or too, uh, too uh, disturbing to have it on the campus, and so they came up here. Uh, for their experiments. This new location, safely away from campus, would become the foundation of an extraordinary era of technology, launching Bill's career in new directions. Right behind me, at the foot of the San Gabriel Mountains, is the world-famous Jet Propulsion Laboratory. It's a big complex of, of buildings and machine shops, offices, computers, libraries, but it wasn't always this way. Originally, it was just a few uh, buildings down on the floor of the dry arroyo. The people up here were doing experiments with rockets and they would blow them up every now and again and they realized that they needed better instrumentation for measuring things which happened very quickly and uh, so they came to me and said how about using some of this new newfangled electronics for the instrumentation problem. This then led to Bill developing a system of wireless communication for this that became the standard for US rocketry. Bill Pickering soon became a popular face around the ever-expanding lab and was even invited to press the launch button on one occasion with legendary consequences. Jet Propulsion Lab soon became a key centre for military research. During the war, they developed uh, rockets which were used for jet assisted takeoff of aircraft. Back in those days, uh, with uh, ordinary propeller driven airplanes, the takeoff was relatively slow and you needed a, lo a long runway. And from the military point of view, they were delighted that by using a, a rocket motor, attached to the airplane, you could make a much shorter takeoff, and that led them to work in rocket systems or, or ballistic missiles, more or less like the V-2. There was a project, I think it was called Operation Paperclip, when after the war, both the United States, the Allies, and the Russians both went in to occupy Germany and tried to get as much of their technology, in many cases, in terms of their scientists, as they possibly could. Pickering was involved in debriefing the German scientists, notably Werner von Braun, who would become an unexpected future ally. 
Well, uh, Chris von Braun was a great hero in Germany during World War II. He was uh, uh, the principal father of the V-2 rockets, which were called Vengeance II, which were fired into, the, into England, into Belgium and, uh, and Holland, were sort of terror weapons. Werner von Braun and I think of a little over 100 of his people were brought into this country and were put in, a, put in uh, residence at White Sands Proving Ground. There was also a large number of V-2 parts. And so they, in effect, started flying V-2 missiles out of White Sands. Von Braun had come striding out with several followers. Uh, and um, say, goot, or nine, and goot, nine, and so on, and give a very summary opinion on what they were doing there and then go back to his quarters. Pickering's ability to understand the V-2 systems was noted, and he was put in charge of the Corporal and Sergeant missile projects, combining German and US technologies. One of the problems which you have with a long-range rocket is that when it comes back into the atmosphere, of course, it gets red hot. And uh, von Braun and his people first ran into this on the V-2. They picked a target somewhere in Poland, and they shot several of these things, and none of them seemed to land anywhere near the target, and they wondered what on earth was going on. And so f finally Werner von Braun himself said, oh, look, I'll go out and stand on the target, and you shoot at it, and I'll see what happens. And, and he did, and he saw the thing explode in the atmosphere, and then they suddenly realized that there was enough residual fuel in the, in the, in the machine, so when it got in red hot coming into the atmosphere, it just exploded. We were developing uh, a missile called the WAC Corporal. It was basically a sounding rocket. Well, there was a hybrid vehicle put together which put a V-2 with a WAC Corporal on top. It's called the Bumper WAC. And it turned out that was the first launch out of Cape, what is now Cape Canaveral and it set an altitude record of 250 miles, which at that time was a pretty big deal. The missile projects were incredibly successful, partly due to Bill Pickering's ability to manage the various components. This was noted, and in 1954, he was offered the overall directorship of the rapidly expanding Jet Propulsion Lab. Probably he was the most likely candidate because he had the background in both the rocketry and, uh, and the electronics. And in, uh, in the case of missile development, uh, those were two very essential parts of coming up with a good missile system. DeBridge, who was the president of Caltech, then appointed me to this position. And I think, I suspect he surprised quite a few people, particularly the ones in the aeronautics department, who, th who thought of this as being a, an aeronautics development. But anyway, it, it's, it's worked out. Bill Pickering had only been director of JPL for a short time when his work became focused toward a new scientific frontier. The development of the space program was tied to the International Geophysical Year, which was a, an agreement uh, among scientists to, uh, to, to work together to develop information about the Earth. And uh, Eisenhower made the announcement in 1955 that the U.S. would develop a scientific satellite as a part of its IGY activity. Very shortly after, the Russians made the same announcement. At the time, JPL were involved in some of the most advanced rocket research in the U.S. However, Eisenhower wanted the satellite to be perceived as a peaceful venture, and JPL's military connections therefore ruled them out of the contract. And he set up a project which was actually run by the Navy, a project called Vanguard. And Vanguard required the development of a complete system, the rockets and everything else. Well, by about 1957, we were getting worried because we felt that Vanguard was in trouble. And uh, although we were working for the Army, uh, we had some ideas as to how to, to use some Army rockets and uh, put an orbit, a satellite into orbit. So uh, we were sort of chewing our fingernails and wishing we could get involved when the Soviets launched their first Sputnik in October of 1957. History had been made. Humanity had entered the space age.
With the launch of Sputnik, the space race was now on. The Russians were in the lead, and Bill Pickering would soon face the greatest challenge of his life. And although we'd all talked about satellite orbits and thought we knew all about them, when it came to the real life problem of having scattered data and trying to figure out the orbit, it literally took us all night to, <laughs> to, to figure it out. We didn't have any computers in those days either, of course. But anyway, we, we finally figured it out. And, and uh, we put out a press release and said it was going to fly over the United States so many times a day and there wasn't a darn thing we could do about it. The U.S. people as a whole uh, were very, very startled. The assumption that people were making, of course, was that the Russians were a group of peasants and they wouldn't know anything as sophisticated as required to put up a satellite. The result of that was that the U.S. government came to the army and said, OK, you guys, we want a backup to Vanguard. And it was just as well they did because in December of 1957, Vanguard did a demonstration test flight, uh, which was a, a media show. spectacular show for the media, but rather a disaster for the, for the business. And so there was then a meeting, I think it was held in the Secretary of War's office, where the, the decision was taken to let the Army try to launch a satellite. We've been assigned the mission of launching a scientific Earth satellite. And we will use the Jupiter-C configuration as a carrier that we developed along with the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. I promised the Secretary of the Army that we would be ready in 90 days or less. Under the leadership of Bill Pickering, the scientists and engineers at JPL rose to the challenge of building the Americans' first satellite. He saw that the most important thing for the laboratory to do was to do the payload, to do the spacecraft itself. And so he managed to convince General Medeiros that that should be done by JPL and that Von Braun and the people in Huntsville should build the first stage rocket. By this time, Werner Von Braun was a U.S. citizen, heading up the Army's ballistic missile division. His team would work in conjunction with Pickering's to create the firepower needed to launch the satellite. Uh, a project like uh, firing a satellite into orbit is uh, only possible if there's splendid teamwork all the way through. Uh, when the go-ahead was given, uh, the uh, next question is, well, what's, what's the payload going to be? The scientific experiments will be selected from those originally planned as a part of the U.S. IGY satellite program. And I said, well, now look, Van Allen, with his cosmic ray experiment, has an experiment which lends itself to the cylindrical configuration we have. My original proposal, which was the one accepted by the review committee, was to measure cosmic ray intensity above the atmosphere on a comprehensive worldwide basis using this satellite. And so the next problem was, where's, where's Van Allen? Well, I was on a, a ship uh, en route to the Antarctic in uh, October 1957. I got the dispatch, uh, radio dispatch from Dr. Pickering uh, saying that they had uh, proposed to, uh, to adapt uh, my experiment for a different purpose. It was all very uh, secret at the time. The Army was given the go ahead and we said we would do it in 90 days and we did it in 87 days. The launch was set for the evening of January 31st, 1958. Although the launch would take place from Cape Canaveral, it was decided that the principal figures, Pickering, Von Braun, and Van Allen, now returned from Antarctica, should follow the proceedings at the Pentagon. And our communication with the Cape was just the plain old telephone. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Bye, command. Bye, Bye command. command. So uh, uh, we were talking to them down there, and yes, they launched it, and yes, it looks like a good launch. And uh, we think it's in orbit. 
and this was the Secretary of the Army said, look, we're not going to make any public announcement until you guys have picked it up in California. And we know it's gone at least once around the world. Bill was, of course, the principal person in keeping um, in touch with the uh, JPL stations around the world. So he was on the phone a good deal, talking to his people, and then you know, always came back and started out, nothing, nothing yet, nothing yet. The orbit had been estimated by some people down at the Cape, and, and Hibbs had calculated this orbit and said that it should get over California at such and such a time. And so uh, the time came and went, and no word. So, you know, sort of a quiet gloom sort of settled over the room after 90 minutes, 100 minutes, still hadn't heard anything. Didn't sound very good. It sounds like we had a failure of some kind. And, and it was actually eight minutes, and probably the longest eight minutes I ever spent in my life, waiting for that word to come back from California, that yes, we've got it. And they did. That was the first reception. And the whole room just burst into uh, cheers and exultation. Everyone was pounding each other on the back. If ever there was a person in the right place at the right time, it was William Pickering. He had the vital essence of curiosity that provided the, the unrelenting momentum that he brought to the, the space program. So the question is, has any form of life been placed in the satellite? <laughs> Maybe we have a Florida cockroach inside, we don't know. <laughs> On that night in 1958, America entered the space race, and at the head of the ride was Bill Pickering, now a long way from small town New Zealand. And believe me, our house just came unglued <laughs> when all of that arrived. I mean, my mother and I were so excited, and. There was an invitation to the White House to appear for dinner about three days after the successful launch. And of course, we had to get her suitably attired and, and um, all of that. So it was very exciting. I was a teenager at that point. We all realized, of course, that, that from then on, our life was going to change. After Explorer 1, Pickering's team launched several more satellites. The combined data from these missions led James Van Allen to discover that the Earth was surrounded by areas of high radiation, what we now know of as the Van Allen belts. I remember shortly after Explorer was launched being asked the question, when are we going to go to the moon? and saying, well, in about 10 years, we might have something more or less equivalent to Explorer going to the moon. Well, my goodness, in 10 years, instead of Explorer, it was Apollo that went to the moon. And uh, that development was very, very rapid. And it was an example of what can be done when you have, uh, shall I say, all the money you need and the political thrust that says you, we've got to succeed. The uh government decided that uh, they should have a non-military space program that should be initiated. And uh, this was the beginning of NASA. The space agency then began business in October. By December, they had uh, decided that they would like to pick up this laboratory, and they had worked out a deal with the Army that we would phase out our Army work and then get into the space program. And one of the questions that came up was, what role do we want to play in the space program? They said, look, basically, we have satellites that are spinning around the Earth, fairly close to the Earth. We have a manned space program, and we have a deep space program to explore out beyond uh, the Earth. And I said, I would like to do the deep space program. And they gave it to me. And I was delighted because, to all intents and purposes, I was sitting there with a contract that said, go out and explore the solar system. And that was a wonderful contract to have. And he realized that deep space was the real frontier of this new realm of human activity. He chose deep space. And that is the kind of thing a director does. That is, try to look into the future and say, that's where this laboratory should be headed. Meanwhile, the Russians had continued to advance their own space program. 
And in 1961, the American public were again shocked when Yuri Gagarin became the first human being to go into orbit. President Kennedy was quick to respond. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. And since we had committed to go to the moon, we needed to understand more about what that was going to be about. So the, the unmanned program proceeded to try and investigate the scientific necessities to support what would be coming along later with the, uh, the human space program. Ranger was the early endeavors to find out what the surface and the environment was on the moon. Ranger was a technological leap, the first fully stabilized spacecraft, able to point its solar panels at the sun, its antennae at the earth, and its cameras at the moon. The overall purpose of Ranger was to be flown directly into the moon, returning high resolution video right up to impact. Well, the Ranger didn't work very well. We, we ended up going off in a, a different direction. We had launch vehicle problems. Telemetry problem. We had spacecraft problems. We ended up in the middle of a big congressional investigation. Five Ranger missions in a row had failed, and the entire lunar program was under threat. The public was still mourning for the loss of President Kennedy, and Johnson's new government were anxious for a success in the space program. William Pickering had reason to believe that Lyndon Johnson was mad at him. Certainly the president had never told the chief of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory as much, and it was unlikely he ever would. But what Johnson said and what Johnson thought were often two different things, and there was little doubt that right about now the president was fed up. That's talking, he's more or less right. Many of the problems facing Bill and his team were the unavoidable result of working in such a new and unexplored realm. Failures, Pickering explained, were a necessary step in learning how to succeed. Actually, after five failures, we said, all right, give us a year and we'll solve this problem. There, were lot, there was uh, reorganization, uh, people's jobs were changed out. We went through almost a tightening of the culture and the discipline. We, we were all, already under a great deal of pressure at Ranger 6, and uh, we had a very successful launch. Everything ejected into the right trajectories. Uh, we looked like we were going right into the mission. I remember being up here in the, what we call a space flight operation facility, and uh, here we are we're coming into the moon. And uh, some 30 minutes or so before the impact, uh, we began to start the system to collect the pictures. I was listening to the guy who was the TV tech technician, engineer actually, who was on the net and he started saying, no video output. And of course this thing is just screaming towards the moon. You know, it has no brakes, so to speak. And it's going to impact the moon, no matter what you do. And I was the one that got to relay that message to the audience. The uh, voice on the loudspeaker is a man out at Goldstone saying still no video. No high power video, no video output. Still no video impact. That was a low, low point. Well, after the investigations we had gone through and we thought we had put the discipline in place, and then to have that happen, I mean, uh, it was an emotional moment. There were people in Von Karman Audio Auditorium, which was mostly just JPL, and people who were crying. We had national coverage there right at JPL and uh, were able to report nothing. So uh, it, it not only was uh, a bad failure, but it was done in an extremely bright light. I had a committee from NASA headquarters glaring at me and wondering what to do and wanting to cancel the contract and throw us out and all this sort of thing. I arrived the day Ranger 6 failed, and I thought, what a terrible mistake. I should have stayed at GM. And Dr. Pickering that day, he was sitting there with his hand in his, uh, on his chin, he said, uh, I think I'm going back to New Zealand. He said, there's no point in staying here or whatever. Uh, back in those days, we used to have an annual uh, Queen of Outer Space contest here on the lab. Obviously, I, I crowned the queen. 
Well, it turned out that this was scheduled for just, uh, a f I think it was only a few days after this Ranger 6 disaster. Uh, but uh, when I got up there to Crown and Queen, uh, the whole doggone crowd says, basically, we're with you and we'll go, we'll solve the problem. And, and I, it was a very warm, very satisfying feeling that I had a lab, but by golly, we know we're at the bottom, but we're gonna, get, we're gonna do it. I think that uh, probably his persuasiveness and his ability to be able to explain uh, what had happened and what we can do about it, why, why we would be able to overcome that, I'm sure had to be a, a very large part of the fact that the Ranger program survived. And always there was an uphill learning curve and he always saw that and uh, that was very interesting to me and um, it, you know just conveying this very forward-looking um, learn from all of your experience good bad and indifferent and look forward and I, uh, I Really, I mean, that, that's something that's become very much a part of my life and something that I hope to convey to my children because I felt that was such a valuable thing to offer me as a child. And we persuaded them to give us one more chance, and that was Ranger 7. And Ranger 7 was actually 100% successful, and we had this room next door here full of people, uh, full of the press, and, and uh, it was from then on we knew we were, we were, we were still in business. It's really spectacular to see the moon's surface come rushing up at you at a few thousand feet per second. After Ranger 6 failed, the word got around somebody forgot to take off a lens cover. Uh, I was presented with this from the RCA people who had made the TV system. And they said, here's one of the lens covers for the Ranger 7. And Ranger 7 was highly successful. Lyndon Johnson was now a happy president. And the next step for Pickering and his team was to develop a robotic craft that could actually soft land on the moon, testing the technology that would be necessary for a manned landing. This mission would be known as Surveyor. There was a very noted Nobel Prize winner who said that when we go to land on the moon, we were going to sink 50 feet into the dust. Well, the way I explain that is that I know what his name is, but you don't, because uh, we didn't sink in 50 feet. And I was sitting just below where I'm standing in the, in the control room down there, watching the signal, uh, the image, build up line by line, and that was the first thing that Surveyor spacecraft photographed, was the footpad to see how far it had sunk into the surface. JPL's unmanned lunar explorations were so successful that in July 1969, the scene was set for Apollo 11 and the first manned expedition to the moon. Roger, 1201 alarm. Okay, engine stop. We copy you down, Eagle. I'm going to step off the limb now. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. Although the world remembers the names of Armstrong and Aldrin, it was men like Pickering, leading behind the scenes, who made this moment possible. Throughout the 1960s, JPL continued with its mission to explore deep space, developing several interplanetary spacecraft. Scientifically, our objective is to assist in answering two basic questions. What, if any, life forms exist on the planets, and how has the solar system been formed? We will be many years discovering the answers to such broad questions. With the beginning of the space age, this was a new realm of human activity, and uh, so one had to learn how to actually 
be, uh, operate in this new realm. And uh, so that's one of the key things that was done at Jet Propulsion Laboratory was to learn how to send spacecraft deep into space. And these were the challenges which uh, Dr. Pickering had to organize the laboratory to achieve in a very short time. It turned out it was just five years from the launch of a very simple Earth-orbiting spacecraft, Explorer 1, until the first planetary flyby of Venus in December of 1962, a very remarkable period of intense learning. And again, of course, the question of beating the Russians, of course, uh, came in in the early days. They, they were first, but by golly, let's us see what we can do. And so we were first to Venus. That's how it goes. Lift off. I was in a sorority at Cornell, and uh, it, which made it a, a smaller living group than, than you would have in a dormitory, and uh, we would all have dinner together every evening. And I can remember sitting at the dinner table, and it was actually the houseboy who did the dishes for us, who came roaring into the dining room, slammed open the door, and held up the Time magazine and said, is this your father? And that was the first I knew that he was going to be on the cover. The cover celebrated the successful flyby of Venus by the Mariner 2 spacecraft. And for a while, Bill Pickering became the public face of American space exploration. And then the next day I had to appear in my physics class and the physics professor had seen the cover also. And again, there was that pressure of, uh, you know, well, if you're his daughter, you ought to, <laughs> etc. So it was uh, academic pressure. In 1965, Bill again made the cover of Time. Mariner 4 was the first U.S. spacecraft to go past Mars, and we did get uh, a series of pictures. Uh, as you see them on the screen there, the, the bright feature that you were talking about, Bob, is still just right at the little right. edge it's, on. It's rather that's rather clearly a cloud because so that is a cloud. Uh, it's, uh, Over the next 10 years, Pickering's team sent several more missions to Mars, culminating in Viking, which actually landed on the surface of the planet in 1976. And as a matter of fact, the, the Viking mission uh, turned out to be so successful, I think many more people were aware of what was going on on Mars, maybe more so what was going on on Mars at that time than what was going on on Earth. All of these extraordinary missions were undertaken during the 22 years that Bill Pickering was director of JPL. Dr. Pickering had so many things to do at JPL. I had my office right next door to his. And he had a rule that anybody who wanted to see him on any kind of technical matter could come in. Well, we had a big office outside, and some of the people wouldn't let the young engineers in to bother the director. And I saw one such guy who was kind of tearing his hair and wanting to get in. And I said, no, Dr. Perkin, we'll see this young boy. Well, he went in. The man had all the papers in the world, uh, blueprints and everything with him. He went in and talked to Dr. Pickering. And when he came out, he was shaking his head. He said he found the problem in one minute. But, but he was fantastic. And I say, everybody loved him. Everybody loved him. He built that organization until he had to step down because of Caltech regulations. And they have a mandatory retirement age just when you turn 65. Pickering was not ready to go. After Dr. Pickering retired, he would always be invited back for different things. And the new director, uh, would be introduced and he'd get a nice round of applause. But when Dr. Pickering was introduced, the feet stamping, the carrying on, the shouting, it was, it got to be, even he got embarrassed. It was so, it just showed how much they loved him. Bill remained very active after his retirement, consulting in space and related industries. He was awarded an honorary knighthood in 1976 and continued to receive many other accolades in recognition of his contributions to the space age. And also, this is a rather nice one. I have an asteroid, asteroid named after me. It's a very small asteroid. It's very hard to see. He wasn't one to go out to pasture. He was always there at JPL whenever there was something significant going on. 
Voyager was one of Bill Pickering's legacies, which uh, continues yet today, even today. It turned out that once every 176 years, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune are on the same side of the sun, and it's possible to send a single spacecraft by all four. It's called the Grand Tour, and that opportunity was in the time period of 1976 through 1979. And so it had to start in the early 1970s in order to be ready to go. Bill Pickering and his team again rose to the challenge, redesigning the Mariner spacecraft to make the longer journey. Although Voyager was launched after Bill's retirement, he always kept in close contact with mission control. We knew we were on a mission to discovery, but none of us knew what was ahead. Uh, there are literally dozens of diverse worlds in the outer solar system that Voyager saw for the first time up close. The great red spot on Jupiter is a huge hurricane light storm system that's two to three Earths across. We found that the moon Io, which is about the size of our moon in orbit around uh, Jupiter, had eight active volcanoes. It has a hundred times more volcanic activity than Earth. And next to it, another moon called Europa, which has the smoothest icy surface we've ever seen and likely has a liquid water ocean beneath it. Uh, on to Saturn, we found that the rings were much more complex than we imagined. On to Uranus, tipped on its side, and we found its magnetic pole was down near its equator. And then finally, Neptune, where 30 times as far from the sun as the Earth, one nine hundredth as much solar energy, and it has the fastest winds in the solar system and just one surprise after the other as we journeyed out through the solar system. In fact, one of, one of the things that we did with Voyager was after we left Neptune, the scientists said, look, there's no point in taking pictures anymore, there's nothing to take pictures of out here. And so we're going to turn it off. And, and someone came up with the idea, look, before we turn it off, why don't we turn around and take a picture of the whole solar system as seen from outside? And so we did, and the Earth is one pixel <laughs> on that picture. We were a long, long way from Earth. The most remarkable thing, really, is after that thing is out there several billion miles, first of all, we know where it is, and secondly, we're still talking to it. Incredible. Bill's first wife, Muriel, died in 1992. A few years later, he married his widowed neighbor, Inez Chapman. It was wonderful for me to know that Inez was watching out for him, and it was even more wonderful to be with them as a couple and to hear them laugh and enjoy each other's company so much. It was just fabulous. Bill even brought his new bride back to New Zealand in 2003 for the opening of the Pickering Rutherford Memorial in Havelock. New Zealand was his love. There's no question about it. Everybody that knew him knew that. I never even knew where New Zealand was until I met him, and I, then I started looking it up and getting interested. Then we went to visit it, such a beautiful place. And he was so proud, showing us all around, this is here and this is there. And you have to see this, and you have to see, and this bird is such a, he knew everything about New Zealand. Bill, when he went up to fame, he received some very large monetary prizes, and he donated that to the California Institute of Technology to support New Zealand graduate students to do research there. He remained very humble about all of the things that happened to him and absolutely amazed at the people he was invited to meet and the, and the circumstances that kept coming up for him. And uh, I think he was surprised by each one. He never got used to it. It was a marvelous experience that I went through. I started in 1964, and then I stayed with him until a month ago when he died. And then the, the book ends talking about a party for Mr. Webb, who was the retired director of NASA. It says I walked over and joined him at the end. And it was a pleasant evening, I said. Webb nodded, long overdue, Pickering added. Webb shrugged, but with a small smile. Pickering looked around the room slowly. Above his head, hung from cables attached to ceiling beams, were three of his spacecraft suspended in eternal flight. Webb followed his gaze. Nice machines, the ex-NASA administrator said after a silence. Now it was Pickering's turn to shrug. They did the job, he said. The few people left in the museum started moving toward the exits. Wordlessly, the two scientists began to follow them. Before they'd walked, walked even a few steps, however, Webb stopped and turned to Pickering. 
You know, he said, I may not have mentioned it at the time, but I always thought you fellows had a fine operation out there. Pickering nodded. A real fine operation, Webb repeated. Pickering smiled and the two men walked on. And overhead, a few more lights clicked off. The, the, the point of this was, from time to time, we had a very rough time with Webb, and Webb was pretty hard on us. But, as he says, he knew we had something good out here.